Tonight, the Chancellor promises a budget to meet the moment. But does it do enough to tackle the extraordinary place we're in? We speak to the government and to Labour. You might have thought you'd heard most of it already, but tonight we ask what it all means for the young, the old, the NHS and the key worker. Also tonight, the EU accuses the government of breaching international law for the second time over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Why has the government unilaterally decided to act? We ask them. And a mammoth session before the salmon inquiry for Nicola Sturgeon. Has the First Minister done enough to save her job? We're live in Edinburgh. I must rebut the absurd suggestion that anyone acted with malice or as part of a plot against Alex Salmond. Hello, good evening. It was a budget to meet the moment, the Chancellor said today, and this moment after the year we've had is a pretty big one. Many of the COVID protection measures have been extended to last the summer. The furlough scheme, the uplift on universal credit, and there'll be freezes on duties and personal tax. A welcome relief for those facing an uncertain six months. But what about the bigger picture? Well, of that, there was considerably less. The NHS that has shouldered the burden of the pandemic was hardly mentioned. There's still no plan for social care. And the solution to the housing shortage was generous mortgages, a throwback to the policy of the Cameron years, which doesn't address the shortage. Was this ambitious enough, asked Labour today, given the structural inequalities the pandemic has exposed? We're going to pick up on some of those thoughts with our guests in a moment. Uh, before we do, let's take you to a few of the front pages just coming in now. The Times has the highest tax levels for 50 years. The Guardian has spend now, pay later, Sunak flags major tax rises as the Covid bill soars. And the Sun has um, a glance, obviously, to the booze, fuel and furlough boost. The only way is SUP. Prepare yourselves for an almighty hangover. And uh, we'll be speaking right now to Harry Cole, the Sun's political editor, and Sonia Soda, the chief leader writer of The Guardian and Observer. Um, Sonia, let me ask you, wh what do you think the budget's answer was to those young people that we just heard from who, whether it was the sociologist or the guy that worked in a nightclub or the guy that just said his chance had been taken away? Wh what did you hear that would sort of directly make them feel there was a future there? Unfortunately, I think there wasn't very much for those young people. And I think what that excellent report from Seema Kotecha there just speaks to is that this is an economic crisis that has been experienced very differently by different sorts of people. So older, more affluent households have managed to weather it OK, actually. If you've got a white collar professional job, you're working from home, actually, you've been able to save more. You've seen your outgoings decrease. If, on the other hand, you're a low paid worker, an essential worker, if you're a young person, fresh out of university, you're doing zero hours uh, work, perhaps in, you know, waitressing at a bar or whatever, um, it's been far, far tougher. And I think although the Chancellor did spend on some of the really big ticket items like the furlough scheme, which lots of people will be really grateful for, there was much less in there for those at the very sharpest end. So you've got the, the universal credit cut coming up. It's not enough really being spent on unemployment support and skills retraining for mm. young people. Let We're going to have some of the lowest employment unemployment benefits, um, you know, it's in real terms since the 1990s, once this universal credit cut comes in, in, into force. Let me bring in um, Harry on that. We've seen some of the headlines in the papers, Harry. What do you think the, the Chancellor would want to be reading tomorrow? Is it about the tax hikes that are coming or is it about the spending that's staying? I think it's a, it's a bit of both. I think there's a different messages to different people as well. Um, you know, when the, when the Chancellor is talking about getting real and waking up and, and looking at the, the state of the nation's coffers, £407 billion pounds now, the final bill for COVID, he's bet another £65 billion in delaying a bit of the pain in order to try and get the economy to get up and running on that. I think he'll want to see, want to see people talk about the fairness of this by actually pushing the the first uh, attempts to pay for the bill for COVID onto the biggest businesses. Um, but he's also, I think, trying to speak as well to the international money markets, to lenders, to, to, to the financial markets, who he needs to be shown to be beginning to get a grip 
on the on, on the, the massive amounts of spending and borrowing that Britain has been doing the highest rates since the uh, since the Second World War in order to keep those borrow you know to keep that borrowing rates mm. low because um, the, the worst thing that can happen now and something that will really upset the apple cart of this budget is if borrowing starts to get more expensive because that's when Britain really will be staring down the barrel of a, a potentially bankruptcy. They're curious things, uh, budgets, because they normally have to sort of filter through and percolate a bit. We, we sometimes don't really know that the true story or the story that will sort of catch the public imagination um, for, for, you know, 24, 48 hours. Is there any detail that you've seen here, Sonia, that you think uh, will actually be, be sort of more important than we realise currently? Well, I think you're right. There was a, I think there was a lot of kind of um, sort of high octane stuff in there, you know, around levelling up. So, for example, relocating part of the Treasury to Darlington. But actually, mm. I personally think the biggest story out of this is the stuff that's missing and the stuff that people are really going to feel over the next six to 12 months. So I do think it's, you know, it's things like the lack of sufficient funds for skills training, you know, the four billion cut that's coming down the line for public services. I think, you know, as much as the Chancellor tries to sort of create the narrative around this, which is I'm levelling up, I'm relocating these jobs, there's lots of money for capital investment here. I think the reality of people's lives are that, you know, if you're an essential worker, if you're a care assistant, a teaching assistant, if you're a supermarket shop, you know, stocking supermarket shelves, you're the people who've been keeping the economy and keeping services going um, during the pandemic, putting your life at risk. You're going to feel this really really sharply, the stuff in the Chancellor's budget isn't really going to make much difference to you. And I think that's the story we're going to see emerge in the coming weeks. Harry, what about the mechanics of all this? I mean, a lot of that was very familiar today. It's clearly a strategy um, to, to brief this stuff out ahead of time. Is, is, that, is that to make it all taste nicer or so the shocks aren't as shocking? What, what do you think's behind that? Yeah, look. Of course, there was a bit of that, and we had the the mandatory sort of budget rabbit. It was a bit technical um, this this time round, but it was a vast amount of money encouraging businesses to bring forward investment plans to be able to claim tax back on them, on on any sort of upgrading they do of their kit. Um, however, it's not quite the retail package that uh, other chances have, have given as a sort of rabbit flourish from that. Mm. Yeah, look, yes, we all know that that, that, that this budget had to be the time that, that the sort of the action began to uh, to do it. And it was quite a clever piece of, of PR, you know, call, call me a cynic. You know, it kind of worked. They did get the tax rises out out of the bag, out, sorry, out of, yeah, out of the bag early. However, they did hold back some crucial details about the corporation tax. We knew it wouldn't necessarily be a hike to 25% from 19% immediately, mm. and it isn't. It will kick into 2023. There's room perhaps for it not to happen should the econ econ economy really bounce back. But it's excluded small businesses, and this is something that's been really crucial. We've looked at some polling in our paper tomorrow, and there's an element of people actually saying, actually, that is fair. There are large companies Companies who have made a lot of money out of this pandemic. I think just off the top of my head, the supermarkets, for one, mm. who've had a really, really good year. Um, so companies that have to be making a significant amount of profit will be the ones that, that are paying this higher rate of corporation tax. So there was a little bit held back. And, you know, look, no chancellor wants to stand up and say, I need to put up taxes. <laughs> I think other chances have tried to do it in a far sneakier way. He did actually, to his credit, say, look, this isn't, you're not going to like all of this. Some of this is bad news, but what can I do? Uh, uh, lastly, just to you, Sonia, it, the, it was a bit of a land grab, this. I mean, I'm thinking from Labour's perspective, um, he sort of covered left and right. Uh, I, I wonder, I mean, they said, you know, pretty much it's the stuff that's missing rather than the stuff that's there, but there's nothing particularly that they change. Does this make life quite hard for Keir Starmer? I do think it was quite a tricky budget for them to oppose from that perspective. When you're basically saying, we do what you do, but more, um, that's not exactly the most kind of compelling message to the public. I think bearing that in mind, I actually thought Keir Starmer did a pretty solid job in his, his speech opposing Rishi Sunak um, today. And I do think that, you know, it, it, it's what will emerge in, in the coming weeks. I think it's really easy for us Westminster watchers to kind of obsess over, you know, 
what Keir Starmer says in the moment now. But the fact of the matter is, this is a very difficult stage in the parliament for a Labour opposition leader to, to be heard, for his message to cut through. And I think far more important for Labour is what they're saying in a couple of years' time, when we see what the economy is doing, when people are really feeling the effects of this budget. You know, it, there wasn't much in there for people who've been at the sharpest yeah. end. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's what's going to be most relevant for Labour. Thank you very much to you both. Thanks for joining us. And that is all we've got time for, unfortunately, tonight. But thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.